Hey, it has been a great couple of weeks here. Obviously, we know. Uh, and if you don't know, then I'd love to catch you up. There is a virus going around right now um, that has caused us to be creative in some ways that we may not have tried before. Uh, and so we did uh, find a way to make kids camp um, that was canceled, happen on our, our campus, third through fifth graders a couple weeks ago. Madison, who you, you saw this morning, our girls director and I were able to pop in and meet the rising sixth graders coming up to my world in student ministry. And it was an incredible time uh, for them to get out of the house, to have something to do um, and for us to change the pace a little bit. And it's, um, Jason's mentioned it several different times that our ministry is gonna continue to go forward even in the midst of uncertain times. And uh, though we may have to get creative in certain settings, we are um, going to be pressing forward and it's your gifts and your faithfulness that allows us to do that. And so we're super thankful for all that God is continuing to do even in the midst of some crazy times. And so my name is Graham and I'm the student pastor here at uh, Clearview. And again, I mean, I'm just so honored to be able to be a part of this morning with you. Um, we are uh, continuing today in our, our series called Mindset. Um, we are in, I believe, week three. And so we're, we're looking at kind of taking a deep dive into what it is that is in our minds, taking inventory, uh, if you will, of the things that we allow ourselves and our, our minds to wander towards, the things that we allow ourselves to take a hold of. And uh, learning to filter certain things in order to look more like Jesus. And I'll just be honest with you, uh, today is a difficult topic. Uh, today we are going to be dealing with overcoming a mindset of anxiety. And I so appreciate our pastor for giving me this topic and then leaving town. Um, and so um, in some ways that's freeing because he's not in the room to drop the people's elbow on me. But in other ways, uh, it seems a little convenient. But uh, anyway, we're going to be dealing with, um, with a topic today that I just want to, uh, as you turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, 2 Timothy 1 is where we're going to hang out together today for a little while. Read eight or nine verses there. And I just want to, before we move forward at all, realizing the sensitive nature of um, this issue, um, culturally, societally, even in your own circles, maybe the word anxiety comes to you and it brings up a lot of different thoughts. And so I just want to set the record straight with a couple of disclaimers. Okay, disclaimer number one, I am not a clinical psychiatrist. I am not going to stand up here today and be in any way dismissive of a mental health issue. I have no interest in overlooking a chemical imbalance or some sort of clinical issue that requires uh, treatments of any kind. So if I speak flippantly today or if I, if I come across seeming unsympathetic, I really am, that, that is the last thing I want today because I'm not pretending at all that, um, that I have all of the answers, which is the second disclaimer. I don't have all of the answers. I'm not the authority on anxiety here, but the good news for us is as you're turning to 2 Timothy chapter 1, we're going to consult the one who is the authority. We're going to consult the one who does have all of the answers and the one who has woven our, uh, us together even in our mother's womb and knows every hair on yours and my head. And my third disclaimer today is that I struggle with anxiety. There have been days where I have felt myself in a moment swing from one side to the other. There are days where my, um, I've, I've had to seek outside help for things that I have faced and struggles that I've gone through. There are things about me that have caused emotional instability at times, insecurity, and in a lot of ways, deep, deep-seated uh, frustration. And my own admission of that this morning, maybe for some of you in the room, you're like, well, then why are you on the platform? Right? Like if you, if you struggle with this and you're admitting that you, you deal with it too, then maybe we should holler at somebody else who is able to fix it. And maybe for you, your eagerness and willingness to listen to me this morning just went all the way into the floor because I've admitted that to you. But maybe there are others in the room that feel a little bit freed up. There's others in the room that, that think, oh, you know what? Real recognize real. Like, I, I get it. And I, he, he's credible to me now because I know that he understands. Either way, I hope that you can relate. According to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, anxiety clinically affects over 40 million adults in the United States each year. So whether you feel like you struggle with anxiety at any, at any point, you probably could throw a rock in this room and hit someone who does. 
Whether it's a, a sibling, a, a mom or, or dad, a neighbor, a coworker, someone in your life, if it's not you, it's someone who deals with some deep-seated and deep-rooted level of worry, of anxiety, of running hot. And so maybe for you, it's not something that rises to a, a level of clinical. Maybe you would sit in, the, in your seat today and say, hey, I, I feel like it's not something that's going to apply to me. I feel like I'm pretty okay. I know what scripture says and I, I, I'm good and I, I feel like I've, I've got it kind of under control. And that's great. But maybe for you, it's today as we kind of unpack some things it, scripture teaches us. Maybe today is the day you realize, hey, I don't, I, you know what, I, I do have struggles. Maybe it comes in the form of doubt, of cynicism, a cynical heart. Maybe for you, it's, um, we had this conversation with one of our interns this summer. Um, ever, anybody ever heard the argument uh, between pessimism and realism? People who say they're realists have been accused of being pessimists. That's just the argument, right? And no, I'm not pessimistic. I'm just being a realist. I'm just thinking in real terms. And maybe for you, you find yourself, as we talk about it, man, I really am prone to think worst case scenario. I really am prone to, to, to run a little bit hot when it comes to my worry, my anxiety, the pressure that I, I face. Uh, I'll be honest, when I was given this topic for this weekend, first I was like, awesome. And then I became anxious. And so, um, but um, when I was given this topic, I decided that there are plenty of other people who have spoken to this issue before and have gone before me. And so I began to read articles listen to certain podcasts or sermons that other people had dealt with this kind of an issue before. And, and I'll just be totally just uh, all cards down. The resounding takeaway from most of those sermons, podcasts, articles was if you just love Jesus more, then you're, you wouldn't experience worry so much. You just worked harder. You just listened to these Songs, you just read these scriptures. If you just love Jesus, you go to church more. If you just love Jesus more, you wouldn't worry so much. I'm just going to be blunt and tell you I think that's a pretty cheap approach, a shallow in nature, because it places the burden on you to fix it. If you did this, then it would get better. If you did that, then you wouldn't suffer so much. Not only do I believe it to be a cheap approach, I also believe it to be an unbiblical approach approach. I could be wrong, but I can't seem to find in my study any area of scripture where that approach is prescribed in the Bible. You just figure it out. You work harder. You just love Jesus more and everything gets fixed. And speaking of the Bible, we are going to look at scripture today because I'm not the authority on it. And so 2 Timothy chapter 1, you're there. We're going to read starting in verse 1. Paul An apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy. So right off the bat, we see it's a letter written to an individual, a leader in a church. My beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Verse 3, I thank God, whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears and long to see you that I may be filled with joy, we're getting a a peering into the window of their relationship, the depth of their connection and their friendship. Verse five, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you also. How many of you are thankful for praying mamas and grandmamas? Verse 6, for this reason, what reason? Because of the faith that dwells in you, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Verse 7, here's our verse that we'll be hanging out on today. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. In verse 9, we'll finish here. Who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. So with this letter, Paul very clearly intended to bring encouragement to his brother Timothy, his young protege, the one that he was trying to raise up to take 
over. In fact, in chronological terms, this is the final letter that the Apostle Paul, who penned most of the New Testament, this is the final letter that we have that's recorded from Paul. Not only the final letter to Timothy, who he'd been training up, but the final words that we have on record from Paul at all. And so I think it might be safe to assume that if Paul knows his energy is depleted, his time is running short, that the words that he would say would be very carefully chosen, measured, not to be morbid, but to think of someone who knows they're in their final moments of life. Everybody crowns around the, the bed. And here's the final words. Those are important words. Nobody brings up the Titans game. Nobody brings up typically politics. It's always heartfelt, serious, and meaningful words. And so if we're to assume that Paul believed and agreed with that, that he would use his final words um, to, to be deeply important and to be critically useful, then we believe that as he speaks to Timothy, who um, Timothy was the man who, who Paul had deemed uh, to carry his ministry forward. He was carrying the mantle a little bit. And just to think about Paul's life, facing all sorts of issues and persecution and dark days, Timothy, assuming that role, would mean that he also inherited persecution. Difficult days, a lot of reasons to have anxiety, a lot of reasons to worry. You see, his encouragement to Timothy was simple, really. See to it that the faith on the inside remains stronger than the fear of the outside. Make sure the faith on the inside that dwells in you because of your grandmama and your mama invested in you. See to it that the faith on the inside remains stronger than the fear of the outside. Never let worry rule the day. So why is Paul so concerned in his final um, days, weeks, months? We don't know. Why would this be the critical message? Why would this be the one that Paul spends his time on? Why should we be concerned with it? A friend of mine named Josh Sinkfield said it this way, worry is the product of momentary lapses of atheism. And if that doesn't punch you in the nose, like it does me, Josh didn't say a lot of great things, but that was one of them. Worry is the product of momentary lapses of atheism. And that is, in the moment of worry, of anxiety, of pressure, of of concern or doubt, you actually in your heart move backward into a world without God. You move backward into a world where God is not as powerful as you once believed. And and all of a sudden, the problem that you are concerned about, the anxiety, the source of your worry, takes over. The problem all of a sudden might be too big. Hey, I know that there's uh, something in front of me, and I I know what God said, but man, I, I, I don't know this time. Whatever situation you might be facing for the first time begins to actually feel like it may not be solvable. I know what the Bible says, but I also know what the bill says. I know that God can be a healer, but I also heard the prognosis from the doctor. I know God can restore, but I know how much my parents hate each other. And all of a sudden, the the problem becomes too big or the problem's too small. But God really concerned himself with this. Man, I I think I'm probably supposed to handle this one on my own. He's not, he's too busy. He's too big. He he doesn't really care. I got this one on my own. And it's in those moments, friend, that the enemy does exactly what he's been doing since the beginning. You see, he wants to shift your focus from the promise to the problem. He's been doing it since the beginning of time. It's the oldest trick in the book. He wants to get your mind off of what you have previously believed and get it to focus on something else. Oldest trick in the book. Think back to the Garden of Eden. Here's the promise. You can have everything in the garden. Everything is yours. You'll flourish. You'll have unbroken fellowship with me. Problem. I want the fruit. The one thing that God said I couldn't have, now I'm worried about. I'm concerning myself with and here's the enemy. Hey, did God really say that? Did, maybe he wasn't talking to you. Maybe 
He's trying to test you to see about how, how, much you're, how much strength you actually have, the fortitude that you might possess. Maybe he's trying to see if you'll actually take ownership. Maybe, maybe he wants to limit you. Is that, are you sure that's what he meant? And eventually we find ourselves in a place where looking into that story, getting into the mind of Adam and Eve literally changed the course of human history. Being able to control what they thought, captivate them with lies, taking their mind off of the promises and onto the problem. This is why Paul found it so critically important for you and I to understand and for Timothy in this day to understand what worry, what anxiety, what not controlling your mind because the scripture says we've been not given a spirit of fear but what of power and of love and what self-control. This is why Paul spent so much time on it. This is why in his, his, his final days, this was the primary message. Now considering, let me just t- let, bring the air back into the room. Considering that I disconnected anxiety, worry, and control of your own mind to the fall of mankind, uh, let me let you off the hook for a second, okay? Uh, it, it will allow me to breathe and hopefully you to breathe as well. Here's what I want. This is so incredibly critical that you hear me this morning. The last thing that I want for you today is to feel convicted about your anxiety. It's the last thing I want. Because anxiety in and of itself is not a sin. It's not. Anxiety, the the propensity, the temptation to worry is not inherently sinful. How do I know this? Think back to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Scripture describes it as he was so tied up that he sweat what was described as drops of blood. It's a medical condition. And there's debate over whether it was actually blood or not. But either way, there's evidence of, deep, of him being deeply troubled. Father, let this cup pass from me. If there's any other way. And yet Hebrews 4, 15, among other passages, would tell us that he was without sin. Meaning, deductive reasoning would tell us that anxiety, experiencing fear, experiencing worry is not inherently sinful. See, it's not the feeling of anxiety that gets us into trouble. It's the expression of it. It's not the feeling that gets you in in deep waters. It's, It's the expression of it. It's when the feeling of anxiety produces an expression of doubt, of disbelief or distance from everything you have once believed, everything you have once trusted to be true. That's where the trouble comes in. It's when things break. And that's where the enemy quickly begins to take ground. So if you're anything like me, your mind moves linearly. And so you're looking at the next question, which is, well, how do I do that? Right? How do I take the, the feeling and not make it an expression? How do I keep it from getting that far? In several places in the scriptures, the enemy is described as a spirit of fear. A spirit of fear, meaning that uh, the very nature of the enemy being a spirit requires a place to land. He has to attach to something in order to, to flourish. He cannot do damage when he's alone. Meaning that a precursor to the enemy's activity in your mind is your agreement with him. A precursor to the enemy's activity in your mind is your agreement with him. For you to give him somewhere to land, for you to give him room to maybe think you might might agree with him. You know what, you might be right. Your agreement that even for a moment, God might not come through, that God might not be who he said he was, that the adversity that you're facing might be too big this time, that the situation has changed and now it might not be able to be overcome. And it's in that moment of worry and anxiety where you take everything into account. All the cards are down and everything changes for you and you have a decision to make. Will my problem change the way that I see the promise or will the promise change the way that I see the problem? Will the problem change the way that I see the promise or will the promise change the way that I see the problem. Will my worries inform my faith or will my faith inform my worries? Will I focus on what is fighting against me or who is fighting for me? 
With many of us, we know what the right answer would be, the Sunday school answer, the one that would pass the test to say, well, I, I trust God, right? The problem is that your words don't make that decision for you. Your answer to those questions will be solely determined by your mindset, by what you allow yourself to believe. Pastor Jason, this whole series, he mentioned it last week, this whole series, the subtitle, The Story You Tell Yourself. Your answer to those questions, will I see the promise or the problem? Will my faith inform my worries? Or will I let my worries inform my faith? Your answer is determined by your mindset. Look back at verse 7. I said we'd spend some time there. Verse 7 of 2 Timothy 1. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Notice here how Paul contrasts a spirit of fear with a spirit of power. A spirit of love, a spirit of self-control. This contrast allows us to assume that a critical step to overcoming a mindset of anxiety is taking control of our minds. It's a critically important piece to the anxiety puzzle. Why? Because in John 10.10, familiar passage for many, we read that the enemy has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. By the way, he hates this conversation. He would love for you and I to not talk about it. Let him do what he wants and don't mention it. We're calling it out this morning. He comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I have news for you. He doesn't have any interest in your flat screen TV. He doesn't like your truck. Has no desire to pay the HOA in your neighborhood. So what's he after? He wants to steal your mind. He wants to take your heart. Destroy your soul. It's what he's after, and he wants to control, ultimately, the way that you think. And while the enemy wants nothing less than destruction for you, the second half of that verse is the promise you and I hold to today, that Jesus has come, that we might have life, and life what? Abundantly. And I just happen to believe this morning, church, that that life, that abundant life, is accessible today. That's not a future life. I believe the abundant life is one that we have access to today. However, with that said, I do believe, and this is, you're going to hear this and think, hold on. I think that abundant life comes with a cost. I do. You see, in most accounts of Jesus' interactions with people who had stuff, sin, idolatry, oppression, anxiety, worry, all sorts of different things, the first thing that he did was call it out into the light. making him the worst politician ever. Not making friends with anybody, right? We're not winning friends and influencing people. Sorry, Dale Carnegie. Uh, Jesus, I have to believe just picturing these moments where Jesus would bring out a really sensitive issue that his, his disciples are like, bro, you don't even know her name yet. Hold on. <laughs> like maybe, maybe buy, buy breakfast first before we, before we step in, into the deep stuff. But no, he calls it out. And why does he do that? I don't believe that it's because he just had this deep-seated desire to convict. I don't believe that it was because he just wanted to drop the hammer on somebody. I don't even think it's because he wanted to uh, ridicule or to shame. No, I, I think he does that because Jesus has no interest in doing business in the dark. He has no interest in doing business in the dark. He calls it out in the light, friend, because he wants you to be able to see how he deals with it and that he deals with it. He wants you to be able to watch him as he takes it from you, as he handles it. And the good news for you and me today is that 1 Peter 5, 7 would tell us to cast all of our anxiety onto him. Why? Because he cares for us. So not only does he allow us to bring it to him, but he asks us for it. Hey, bring it to me. Let me handle it. And what happens? I know for me, if I can just be so honest, I'll try to shoulder it on my own. I'll try to do all that I can to just make it, just keep living, to do all that I can to, to muster up the strength to, to fix it, to, to do it on our own. And, and at times, maybe if you're like me, there can be some days where you find it even, even hard to get motivated enough to get out of bed. Where going to work feels like a chore, where your kids feel like obligations, 
where you're taking the joy out of everything because you're dealing with this burden that you're carrying on your own. And it comes to the point where it begins to feel like it's crushing you. And can I just be totally honest with you? I think it's supposed to. It stands to reason that the one thing you were never meant to carry would weigh you down. It makes sense to me that the the thing that you were never designed to shoulder on your own cannot be held up by you. You were never meant to hold it up. That is why Jesus would say, cast it to me. You bring it in here. Call it out and bring it in here. And so because of all this, I believe that sometimes God is leaning out of heaven and he's shouting to us, yo, I will trade you for it. Bring it to me. Go get the fear. Go get the anxiety. Go get the worry. Go get the doubt and bring it, set it on the table. And I'm gonna trade you for it and I'm gonna trade you my rest for it. I'm gonna trade you my peace for it, my life for it. What's the cost? It's honesty. It's transparency. It's openness. That's the cost. God will not fill a heart that is already full of everything else. It's being honest about your condition. It's being open. Recognizing with the Lord and with others, here's where I'm struggling. I mentioned earlier that I've I've dealt with anxiety before. I continue to fight it on certain occasions. I'll tell you a little bit of my story. Maybe you can relate. So I came out of a ministry context in which um, everything seemed to be pretty results-based. It was, it was very uh, results-oriented, very performance-based acceptance, and I ended up in a place where that became my measurement for everything. Numbers, this event... Amount of baptisms, amount of salvations, and all those things are good. Numbers represent people, and so I'm not speaking against that. But it became the only way that I measured my, my effectiveness, my performance. And it came to a point where I, I began to feel this weight and this pressure that I couldn't pinpoint was coming from anywhere else. Jason wasn't giving it to me. Jennifer Helton, Brian, anybody on our team, my wife, you guys, our church was not putting it on me. Well, some of you were. Um, but many of my, my circumstances, I, I couldn't point to where it's coming from. And I began to realize that the source of the pressure was me. The source of the anxiety was me. I was, I was installing it into my life. I remember calling Pastor Jason one morning. I was sitting in the YMCA parking lot, um, about to play basketball with a, with a buddy and uh, like 7.30 in the morning and I called him and I said, hey, I, I don't know what to do here. I've got this issue. I'm not asking you to fix anything. I'm not telling you I hate my job. That is not it at all. But I'm dealing with something and I'm struggling and I can't pinpoint it. And I walked him through about 20 minutes of just, here's my heart, man. And I, I, I don't mean to come across crazy, but I, I just need help and I got to figure it out. And he said, hey, I have a friend who is a professional counselor who deals with all sorts of people, but he also specializes in men in ministry, men and women who serve the church and the things that come with that. I'd love for you to go see him. And at first I'm like, oh, great, I need a counselor. Holy moly, like this, this is not that bad, right? I'm overreacting like, oh, goodness. But it came to a point where I was like, you can get bitter or you can get better. And so I called this guy, we began to have a conversation and um, kept it somewhat to myself, but at, right after fall retreat last November with our student ministry, I loaded up the car and I drove to northern Florida. Spent a week with a guy named Steve and his family. We began to unpack several different things. We began to, to walk through certain things that I'd experienced in my life and try to pull out some of the pressure points, almost as if a doctor pressing on certain parts of the body to see where it hurts and what brings the emotion, the sensation, and it basically felt like I went through surgery for that, uh, those few days. And Steve gave a word that week that has literally changed the way that I see it, and I'm going to share it with you, save you the trip to Gainesville, Florida. As a Tennessee fan, that was anxiety all right there. He said, in moments of worry and fear and anxiety, those who are in Christ have what Steve would call holy options. If you're in Christ, you have holy options to take those things. 
to things you can do that not everybody else can do because you believe in a God who desires you to bring those in the room to him. The holy options changed the way that I saw it. And I, I began to realize that the things that I had been shouldering, I was never meant to. And I'd love to tell you, friend, that I got back in the truck and I drove back to, to Franklin and everything turned over for me and everything got better. And everything, it was almost as if my stuff went away and I was playing free again and everybody was happy and everything was just, had, had dissipated, had gone away, but it's not totally true. By the way, you haven't experienced anxiety until you've pastored through COVID-19. Where I can send an email to, to a bunch of parents about something and within about 10 minutes get three responses that are supportive and two that can't believe I'm doing anything about this. And you know as soon as you hit send, you're welcoming it. And you just, you go to bed at night thinking, and I'm not trying to say this like, hey, like, please be nicer to me. Like that's, it comes with my job, right? That's just the way that it is. I serve at the pleasure. But if you think that that didn't turn the volume knob up a little bit on the things that I'd already been facing where every decision's under scrutiny, there's no playbook, but everybody wants you to have the right one. It brings that pressure back. It brings it all back to the forefront. You see, it was the days, the weeks, the months, and now approaching a year where I began to learn something that I want to free you up to do, uh, to, to, to hear today. Fighting anxiety is a daily battle. The fight against anxiety is a daily and ultimately reoccurring battle. It is not a problem that you solve. It is a tension that you manage, as Andy Stanley would say. The goal is not to eliminate it from your life. It is simply to know what to do with it when you come, in, when it comes. In fact, the very, if you thought about this, the very idea that Jesus talks about your anxieties and bringing them to him as evidence that he knew you would have them. The very idea that in so many different places in scripture where God says, bring your worries to me, bring your thoughts to me, bring your anxieties to me, the very idea that he references them so often is because he knew they'd be there. So it's not eliminating them, it's not getting rid of them, it's knowing where to take them when they come. Elizabeth Elliot said it best, faith doesn't eliminate the fears, it just gives you somewhere to take them. And so today, friend, I, I didn't come with a list of self-help tips. I'm sorry to disappoint those that wanted that. I didn't come with this, if you'll just do this, it'll all get better. You just you check this box and that should fix that and take two of these and call me in the morning. I didn't, I didn't bring that today. Here's how to eliminate your fears. Just do these three things that somehow all start with the letter C. Um, I, didn't, I didn't have any of that for you today. I'm not gonna stand here today and tell you with full assurance that A plus B will always equal C. Because what that will do, if you're not careful, is you'll, you'll look back at me if I tell you here's the things you need to do. If those don't work, now you and I have tension or you and him have tension. I can't promise that it all gets better. I, I just can't. But I do know countless people, myself included, who have found disciplines, things that to install in your life, whether it's reading certain verses about worry or fear or anxiety, whether it's listening to certain worship music in the mornings to set your mind right, whether it's um, finding someone in your life to, to divulge that information to in accountability fashion. I know several folks that those things have helped. But I think it's interesting, friend, that the reason, I think there's a reason that every time we see Jesus talk about it, he never prescribes any other cure than to bring it to him. We never see Jesus mention any other medicine for anxiety than, hey, bring it to me. Let me deal with it. So I guess all I'm saying this morning is the important thing is not how you go to God. It's that you do. It's not how you do it. It's not just take these three steps and read these verses and sing these songs and all of that and everything will go better. No, it may not work for you. God knows you better than any four-step plan ever could. So it's not how you go to God. It's the idea that you are willing to, that you're willing to say, hey, God, I, I'm struggling here. I've got worries. I've got burdens. I've got, I got stuff. 
And I know what I would do with it, and I know that's never worked for me before. And so I want to bring it over. I want to put it where it belongs. I'm trying to encourage you this morning, church, that while your anxieties may not go away on this side of glory in their entirety, there's always somewhere that you can take them. And this is where I want to, I want to land this morning. And I want you to hear this because this is still true for me every single day. He can't redeem it until you release it. He can't redeem it until you release it. Come in with your hands open. Come into God with clenched fists rarely ever works. Open them up. Let him have it. Put it where it belongs. I promise, until you're willing to trust him with it, until you're willing to be honest, vulnerable, open with yourself, with God, with others, whatever release you're looking for, you won't find. So go with me for a moment. We're wrapping up. Go with me for a second. Let's just dream together for a moment. Because anything you and I talk about in this room, for those of us who are in Christ, what happens in here should change the streets out there. So what happens if each of us begin to adopt a, a mindset of freedom? Of saying, hey, I got somewhere to take it. Hey, I, I, I struggle too. A t- a taking on a mindset of honesty, of openness, of being totally dependent on the Lord. What happens if this church adopts that? In our community... There is an immense amount of pressure to keep up with the Joneses. Sorry if your last name is Jones. We're all following you. There's an immense pressure to perform, to keep up, to make sure that your kids have every experience they possibly can, every, at least everything the neighbor's kid has. And we end up spending money we don't have to buy things we don't need to impress people we don't even like. All in an attempt to look the part. Never let them see you sweat. What would happen, church, if we flipped that on its head? Well, we chose to be vulnerable enough and honest enough to be open. Say, so, hey, you know what? I don't have everything that everybody else says I should have. And while I can choose to be anxious and worried about that, I have somewhere else I can take that. I got a different option. What would happen if we all did that? I can tell you what happened before. Acts chapter 2. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And here's the verse. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. That doesn't mean everybody was a UT fan, though that is evidence of salvation. It doesn't mean that everybody liked the same food. It doesn't mean that everybody had the same interests. No, they had all things in common, meaning there were no dark places. We're all together. Later on in that passage, it says, Every day they they continued to meet together in the temple courts, breaking bread in their homes, eating together with glad and sincere hearts. Honest, open, genuine, sincere And the Lord, here's here's the dream, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So maybe what this church needs, what this world needs, what your neighbor needs, what my neighbor needs, anything more than anything else, is transparency, honesty, authenticity, being real. Not our politically charged Facebook posts. Not the things that we would, we, we, our opinions on the matter. Not the things that we think are going to change the world. Because by the way, being more eager to share your political opinion than your faith tells the world which one you believe to be more important. It's not going to move the needle. What will move the needle, I'm convinced is us creating an environment where people can afford to be open and honest. Us being the soft place to land for those around us. One of my favorite people that I've met in Franklin since I've been here was on the stage this morning. It's not Alexis, sorry man. Um, It's a guy named Brett Warren. 
Brett sits back here and plays the organ and makes things sound uh, full and, and bright. And um, he, he is an incredible man. And Brett has the unique opportunity in his industry to influence the influencers. Brett works in the country music industry, and because of Brett's story and the things that, that he's experienced and the things that he's, he knows, he has the unique opportunity to sit down with individuals that you and I would know by name and help them through struggles, help them through issues. And it's not the typical sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It's not, not your typical substance abuse. Sometimes it could be, but my understanding is most of the time it's social media. It's comparison. It's anxiety. Can I tell you something? Brett doesn't get that opportunity unless he works hard to facilitate it. Unless he carefully chooses how he carries himself to the point that others can feel comfortable around him. And he gets to make great gains ultimately for the kingdom of God because of his willingness to open himself up to not create a spirit of comparison or a spirit of, um, you know, you should be more like this or if you don't agree with me, then you go sit over there. But a spirit of, hey, I, I'm here. I get it. It's the prototypical, in my opinion, example of what's possible if you and I are willing to be honest and open about our own issues, know where to take them and be diligent to do so, and then work hard to make impact in this world because of the story that God gives us with it. I think, it's good. I think it literally could change the world. I do. You know, you often don't think about sharing something with somebody like a tweet or an email or sending them a sermon or sending them a podcast. You don't often think of that as missions, but it is. It's not that you have to send it to the whole world or post every single thing we do at Clearview on your feed. But if, if you've heard a sermon or if you've listened to a podcast, think through your life. I mean, God, who needs to hear this? Sometimes it, it, it doesn't need to go on your Facebook page. Sometimes it needs to go on your Twitter. But sometimes just a simple text to one person can make all the difference in the world is sending them the Word of God in real time. Share it. You'd be surprised how far it goes.